the Amash Project. The Amash Project welcomes Cathy Morgan, who gave a tremendous presentation at the first Amash conference in 2012. How, Cathy, did we get to that stage? And you are, of course, the first Amash witness to be interviewed in a long series of Amash witness um, testimonies. So tell us how we got here from there. Right. Um, well, I contacted Amash uh, via Miles, via yourself, um, after seeing uh, the, some of the bases interviews, because I'd always felt um, that my life was unusual, and um, after seeing people talking about uh, having some sort of anomalous uh, intervention in their lives, I began to work on on the premise, research on the premise that that might have happened to me and as soon as I began to research my life it, it turned up thousands and thousands of uh, strange facts that... I mean, this is fascinating what you've done me doing. It seemed to, to form a picture, even though I didn't have memories, my, my memory of my life was very, very fragmented and uh, with lots and lots of blank areas. So when, when I put all the facts together, I became convinced that I was really onto something. Uh, so so I, I was interviewed by yourself in 2011, uh, in, in which I discussed some of these uh, events. And then um, I did a year's research. So my presentation was uh, the results of that research. So what initially are you? What what? did you find out about yourself? You, I mean, you talked about twins and twins research, but let's get back to really who you are. Who is Cathy? If you can do that. Gosh, that's, that's a quite a difficult question. Um, well, I'm somebody who doesn't really seem to have anything in common with anybody else around me in my life. So... Finding a mash was very valuable because I feel like I've found other people who are like me who who don't relate to um, not only to uh, society's values as a whole, which many people don't, but to to the way that other people live their lives um, and what their um, the activities that they do. I've never really fitted in into that. What is involved with your presentation today? Right. Well. In order to uh, uncover um, unusual events in, in my childhood, I uh, interviewed my parents um, and I also researched the area that we're living in in a little bit more depth. Now, my parents, uh, my mother mentioned, I asked if there was anything unusual. She mentioned that we had family, uh, there was a connection with a lady, Moran, and so I went on to research her and found out she worked at Parton Down. And um, now, Porton Downs, the important research facility in Wiltshire. Yes, it's where um, it's where there was testing done on um, military personnel using LSD in the fifties, and it's been used um, obviously for testing on humans. So that was an interesting um, fact there. So I went into more depth with the initial facts that. That, uh, um, also, the area, the, the village of Swainswick, where we were moved to for seven years, is just three miles from uh, Rudlow Manor, where there's um, a, a verified uh, underground utility. And this is where the supercomputers are um, housed. Because um, although the base was kept quite um, hush hush, uh, in 2011, in a local council meeting in Coombe Down, it was um, put on record that the bases, the three bases in Bath were going to be moved and um, 1,100 personnel had already been moved and 1,400 were going to move over the next two years. Now, which However, three bases? Well, that will be Fo um, MD Fox Hill, uh, Rudlow Manor, and, and there's another one, I, I don't know, I, because I've only just kind of come across this information, but they said that... Um, oh yeah, that's it. The um, the computers at the Ensley site might not be able, to, wouldn't be able to be moved because of because of the type of computer that was there. They couldn't move them. Why were they moving? They um, the 
I don't know where they're moving and I don't know why they're moving. It, it was a council meeting and then it was reported in the local paper because they were really talking about the jobs that would be, you know, um, going out of the area. So um, apparently the computers there are used for this. This is on the internet. Um, was used for the Skynet. The use for the Skynet um, program. It said the Skynet program is uh, what's that? Is some kind of well, I don't know. It just it said I, this. Just, on I suspect the... John Lear may have mentioned something about Skynet, uh, but we'd we'd have to th- maybe pass that on for another for a deeper yeah. Time. In other words, they are. Um, it's an important um, area yeah. in, in that so, sense. Um, yeah. What exactly did you find? I mean, in your initial interview, uh, you really did reveal a tremendous amount about mind control in the United Kingdom. Uh, can you add to that? Well, that that's what I wanted to look at because I'd, um, I'd learned about mind control through the MK Ultra program, but all the details were about um, the United States... Uh, and the only thing I'd really seen about um, military mind control was um, the only um, person talking about it was really James Caswell and Barry King. And I wanted to know more. I thought, well, such a lot's come out about MK Ultra, and it's been officially documented in the Senate hearing in the late 70s. But what's about the UK? There's nothing. Nobody seems to be asking about the UK. Well, in Timothy Good's book... Everything seems to be happening everywhere else in the world, and nothing's happening here. Move on. There's nothing going on here. Move on. Absolutely. I think that's but, because it's been particularly effective here. And that's because you are beginning to uncover that Britain is one of the biggest places for mind control. Well, I certainly, my own personal opinion is is that it's been done extremely effectively, and we're virtually a, um, one huge mind control experiment in actual fact. Um, but to get to the bottom of it, to get to the um, the facts that can that can demonstrate that is, is another thing. I mean, we can all speculate, and that can just be easily dismissed. Um, anyway, I did manage to f- start finding links between um, the the uh, conferences that were being attended by MK Ultra um, doctors and practitioners, and people in the UK attending the same conferences, and also people in the UK who went. From um, from the UK to the United States and became involved in the MK Ultra programs. Um, I, do, I found documentation about LSD units, experimentation, and even um, there's been even been compensation for for many many people who've um, who've sought compensation for these uh, experiments, Are these you, LSD experiments in the UK. Uh, any project names or locations? Um, the there was a unit at um, a hospital called Potwell Hospital. Um, there was a hospital in Chelsea. Uh, Birmingham University was involved. Um, I, do, I've, I do bring this into my presentation, and I'm going to follow up the presentation with more detailed facts uh, online. I'll, I'll put those online um, in, in the coming weeks. So, so um, that this was your first presentation, is it? Yes, it was, yeah. You, and you met some people as you came to Manchester. Could you tell us about that? Uh, I came from Manchester to... Oh, oh, oh right, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, the, I came Nottingham from Railway Manchester Station. to Nottingham, and the first person I met when I got off the train, I looked around to ask for directions to the hotel, and um, I got talking to a chap uh, outside a hairdresser's, Shall I mention the, the name of it? No, I better not. <laughs> Actually, it might be inundated. Um, I, I asked him the directions, and I happened to mention, because we got talking, that I was doing this um, presentation on mind control. And he said to me, uh, he said, oh, mind control. He said, yeah, this is why you've met me. Uh, and, and so he went into some detail about his interests, and it, he said, I know all about Project Oak Tree. And so can you tell us about that? I, well, I know very little about Project Oak Tree. All I know is that Barry King mentioned 
um, Project Oak Tree related to a mind control program for people of my age, so people born around 1958, 1960, and it was called Project Oak Tree, and I could find nothing else on it, on the internet whatsoever. And so, and, and so I, because I looked, and, and then I met this chap outside on the way to the conference. He was, I know all about Project, Project Oak Tree. And his father was in, in um, MI6. And uh, obviously I was only talking to him for a short while. I didn't get a great deal of information. Well, tell but, us what you did get. Well, he, basically he said it was to do with the... Um, well. Well, really, that's all he said. I need to follow it up and find out what he does know. He's, all he said was he knew about Project Oatry. But later on, he did. A, he uh, contacted me. Um, we were in communication a few days later, and he told me he was... Um, I mean, I'm quite fact-based, so this is a bit out of my normal kind of um, subject area but but as you bring him up this you know the fact that I met this chap I'm just I'm just describing what um, what he communicated to me and he's he's the chap who uh, who um, knew about Project Oak he says he knows about Project Oak Tree, so that needs following up so in in a couple of words what would you describe yourself as and why are you giving this presentation um, I'm, I'm giving my, the presentation to further um, established facts on um, mind control and, and um, unwi um, manipulation of people unwittingly. I want, to, I want to document that this does happen so that people who um, might be co somewhat confused as to what the heck's going on and who don't have kind of who don't fit into the normal um, lifestyle who've got a more a wider consciousness sometimes they feel quite confused and not sure why so I want to put the facts on the table is well this has happened to people this has happened you can extrapolate that other experimentation is is happening at whatever level whether it's simply through um, basically television program programming social engineering or, or something even more uh, intense than that. I just want to get the facts out there. In the UK, this has happened. You, know? and you mentioned about social programming. What about this thing in schools? Just um, before we commence your presentation, UFO alien pods in schools. Well, what, what's involved there? Well, I um, happened to visit my grandchildren, my daughter and my grandchildren, and asked them what they did at school today. And they said, oh, Nana, um, an alien pod landed in our school. Is this, is this just made up? I'm not, I don't mean you made up, but do you think the teachers made it up for the children to see as a, as a, as a game? No. Or oh, do you think it really, really was real? It was real. No. Were there, were there any police vehicles there? Yeah. yeah, that's police. How many? Two, and then the um, girl went home because the boy kept talking about it. And I thought, what? And this is Rochdale? This is it in Rochdale. So I got my uh, mobile phone out and recorded them, and I asked them, um, tell me about it, what happened? Um, they went on to describe arriving at school, they were kept outside the school, two police cars were there, um, police officers, men in forensic, um, in the full white suits with hoods. Um, there was a, um, a pod, perhaps it was about two feet in, diam in diameter, a circular pod, and, um, or perhaps a little bit bigger, half embedded into the, into the ground, covered by a canvas. And the, um, they were told that they can't go in the school yet because it wasn't, they weren't sure if it was safe to go past this pod. Um, and that the scientists, the people in white suits were scientists, they were taking readings to see if it was okay. They were eventually let into the school and where they were told that pods had landed at other schools as well. Now, I um, said to them, do you, is this really real? Do you think this is really real? Or was it something that the teacher made up as a, as a game? And they said, no, no, it was really real. They really, really believed it. But when they said another school had had pods, I got onto the internet and found a whole list of primary schools that had had this same exercise. So they were deceiving the children, they were shocking them 
by by having these official figures and and deceiving them and the teacher um was also not telling them the truth so so um a large number of primary schools the children have been um led to believe that an alien pod has landed and that there are aliens are absolutely you know these role models teachers police officers are confirming for them yes aliens exist and how many police and scientists were involved with this there were two uh, police cars and uh two policemen in in uniform and two in uh, the white suits two figures in these white forensic suits at the school that my grandchildren went, went to. So my, um, what I thought was, is this, um, you know, because we all, well, not everyone, but many people have heard of Pro Project Bluebeam, which basically uh, says that, um, that in order to bring in a one world government, uh, they need an external threat to unite people and, um, there was talk of a Project Bluebeam where people would be made to believe that there was a U UFO threat, perhaps through a hologram, hologramic spaceship and so on. Now, this is quite old, but obviously the, too many people know about it. That's not going to work. But are they doing a similar um, project on the school children, on all the future citizens of the UK? Are they implanting in in them the very re that that UFOs are real in order to do a similar um, manoeuvre I, I don't know well thank you very much Cathy we'll uh, lead to your presentation and uh, enjoy this excellent presentation you've done for the Amash First Amash Conference and thank you thank you Miles Hi folks, just for the tape, I'm just going to uh, reintroduce Cathy Morgan, just because we've had a tape change, so excuse us for that. So I want you to welcome Cathy Morgan, whose talk is going to be about mind control in the UK, and it's a very personal perspective. Just ask you again, thank you very much Cathy, let's put our hands together. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Okay, I'm presenting my uh, research from a personal perspective. Um, however, um, I will just go over for, I'm sure you're all familiar with MKUltra and um, the way that mind control has been documented to have taken place, but I'll just briefly go uh, mention about that for anyone who, is, who doesn't. Um, so basically, nobody can say that it doesn't exist because um, MKUltra did expose the existence of mind control programs and um, it was fully documented that these had occurred. Um, the, uh, the report of the uh, Senate Committee in 1977 made that quite clear and that is in fact online. If you just go to the wiki about MKUltra you can get links to the documentation, to this document and to um, and to the actual CIA declassified documents as well. So that makes interesting reading. Um, so as, as many of us know, it was um, research that involved murder of tens of thousands and torture of, of tens of thousands of human participants and, um, and it involved um, drugs, psychology, psychiatry, sociology, electric shock. Um, so we're looking here at such things as um, psychotronic uh, weapons, the development of um, implants, um, drug and um, hypnosis, and, um, and so on. So, um, what were some of the drugs that they were trying to develop and test? Well, the interesting thing is that when people come forward to say that they've experienced mind control, and there are very, apparently very few of them in the UK, um, the ones that do come forward sometimes are accused of being um, inconsistent and they may even be rejected for that reason. But however, when you look at the substances that they were developing, it becomes clear that they were actually trying to... Louder? Yes, Sorry. 
Okay, they were obviously trying to um, ensure that people undergoing these experiments did not um, were not able to talk about them, um, both by um, bringing about am amnesia, confusion, and so on. They, they were researching uh, drugs that would specifically do these things. And they also told the police um, that if somebody came to them or was picked up talking about being um, interfered with by doctors, that they were to go to specific hospitals um, they would put to be taken to specific hospitals. Now, so when people do come forward, we, it's important that we have um, that we don't have a, a hostile, hostile climate for them. And if they are talking, and and, and a match really has provided a platform for people to uh, talk about things very freely, which is absolutely wonderful. Now, we know from the declassified documentations that um, the mind control experiments took place in universities, medical centers, which were co-opted and, and infiltrated. We know that happened in the USA. Um, I'm looking at what happened in the UK as much as I've been able to find out. Now, it, it's known that the Macy Foundation um, was a funding conduit for um, used for the CIA to channel funds to the operants, and so I've been um, particularly looking at who was working on, um, under Macy uh, funding in the UK and who was attending the same conferences as the people in America. Um, in fact, it appears that there was a massive social engineering program. Um, for example, the CIA purchased uh, 20 million doses of LSD from the um, Sandus Laboratories and then contracted E. Lilly in Indiana to, for a more reliable source that they could order uh, tens more million. In fact, the, the quote that I saw said, by the tonnage and we're talking LSD by the tonnage, uh, hundreds of millions of doses. And these were distributed freely as well as being used in um, the programs. Uh, they were thrown over, the, for example, bu bundles would be thrown over the walls of campuses to be discovered uh, by the students. Now, um, when you do start researching this, it does become absolutely clear. There's no question that um, that there's an Illuminati new world order that is being that is being rolled out, and and some re researchers, wonderful researchers, um, have, have documented this meticulously. Uh, David Icke in the UK, Alex Jones has done some great stuff on this. Um, Alan Watt in Canada, and Dr. John Coleman, who with his um, work about Tavistock and the Committee of 300, go into it in great detail. Um, but the, unquestioningly, uh, oh yeah, Fritz Spring Mayer, his work on, on the Illuminati too is, is, is wonderful. Um, it's clear though that the majority of people are not aware of this now, because it's it's not talked in schools. It's not um, talked about in the mainstream media. And there's um, been no expense spared to develop distractions of entertainment, sport, and fashion um, and to manipulate the, the populations. Um, the well-documented roots are shrouded in obscurity of distraction, basically. So here are just a few um, examples of the kind of organizations um, so that mind control was perpetrated through um, the research of, um, yeah, of course, organizations like the Skull and Bones and Cecil Rhodes Roundtables. Um, the planning um, was done through the World Federation of Mental Health, the World Health Organization, um, non-government organizations and think tanks. Um, and um, we've got the funding there. These are just a few brief, brief, brief examples of the type of the way that it was perpetrated. Um, 
So it shows that, that manipulation actually goes right to the heart of our medical establishments, our educational establishments, our governmental establishments, uh, which makes it almost unthinkable um, when you talk to people with no um, background of actually scratching the surface on these things. It, it just seems totally unbelievable. But as, as many of us know, the documentation is there. Um, now, now, the interesting thing is how, how did many of these um, psychiatrists, doctors, and so on come to be involved in mind manipulation? Because some of them were doing it unwittingly, and some of them were doing it wittingly. And I believe that it's, um, it's just a question of when you want to get ahead in your career, um, you may think that you're helping people and you're doing good research, but this re research is being appropriated for the New World Order agenda. And it's just a question of small compromises, like a eugenic approach to the public and to the masses not being the same as us. And we, I think we have to all be really careful when we make compromises in order to get through our... Um, day-to-day -day life and as to who we work for and uh, what attitudes we're prepared to adopt because I think it's all these small compromises at every level that allows for this p mind manipulation to take place ultimately and that's all we can do basically. Is I know we do have to do those compromises but get in and get out as fast as you can. That's, that's what I think is the only thing that can be done about it. Now, this research is about my own um, personal experiences, and um, yes, and I believe that um, I came to believe that my family had been subjected to some sort of research interference, experimentation, um, probably to help spread the Tavistock agenda of promoting promiscuity and new age and destructive feminist programming, programming to dissolve the strengths of families and stable religious values. And, um, to, and because um, they like to do it on twins because they like to gauge the progress of the agenda that's being rolled out and they can uh, work with one twin and compare it compare uh, the other twin. So my, my own twin there, I'm the one on the right showing my knickers there. <laughs> and um, my, my other twin had a completely stable life. She uh, got married once and she lived in two houses in her life, and whereas I've lived in probably 40 or 50 different places and uh, had a very chaotic, very chaotic life. <laughs> So um, I, I talked to my parents about um, this. When, when I started to become aware of the mind manipulation that was taking place, I had some lots of alarm bells going off that something of this nature had happened to me. And I decided to interview my parents, or talk to my parents. And as I was interviewing them, um, I realized that I wasn't getting all, all the information, so I started videoing them. I videoed um, interviews of several hours, probably about eight hours of video, asking them questions so that um, I have actually got their testimony on video as to what, what they spoke to me about. Now, one of the things that my mum said, I said, is there anything you can remember that was unusual about my upbringing? And she said, um, well, my mum kept saying that there was a connection with Lady Moran. And that was the interview where... Um, I went into the other room and she followed me out and said, um, be careful who you're talking to, we don't want you disappearing. And, and I was a bit shocked at that, but um, I didn't know who Lady Moran was, but I did check it out and found out she was a scientist at Porton Down who worked in World War I with poisonous gases. Um, she got an MBE at the age of 24 and actually spent a, coma, uh, a year in a coma in St. Thomas's Hospital for a year before marrying Charles McMorran Wilson, who became Lord Moran, or Churchill's doctor, as he's better known. Now, um, one of the more well-known um, MK Ultra type of psychiatrists in England is um, William Sargent because he had a sleep room at St. Thomas's in 1947 and he corresponded with Ewan Cameron who was proven to have been um, researching uh, mind manipulation techniques 
uh, for the CIA, and uh, Sargent was doing very, very uh, similar, virtually the same type of um, therapy in his, in his sleep room at St. Thomas, Thomas's Hospital. Um, now, Lord Moran was his tutor and mentor and gave him financial and moral support, and it was he who suggested that Sargent go into psychiatry because he did his initial um, dissertation on pernicious anemia. Now, we do find that at that time when psychiatry was developing, there was a lot of crossover between the subject areas. So people who were studying the blood, for example, like Sargent, then went into psychiatry. People who were studying um, electronic ma models of the mind were then performing psychosurgery. So the parameters of psychiatry were just being uh, created um, uh, in, in those first decades of the, 19, of the 20th century, and people were moving from discipline to discipline very much. That's very much a feature of what was going on. Now, Dorothy Dufton um, got a grant at the age of 22 from the Royal Society, an Illuminati um, organization, to uh, study poisonous gases. And um, she was a pupil of Sir, jo Sir Joseph Barcroft, who was an expert in fetal development and intergenerational science. Um, now, um, <laughs> um, her father actually also studied gases. He was called Felix Dufton, and he patented something called a fractional gas separator, which enabled gas to be separated from matter. And um, he patented it. It's called the Dufton tube. So he was where he, it was in the family. So I wondered if where the connection with my family was. I've been trying to find out. Now, her father actually became a school inspector in Leeds uh, when, he, when he retired from... Um, being a scientist, so that's one possibility. And the other possibility is my grand great grandfather uh, made a great deal of money supplying horses to the military in World War One. Um, we had a large house. With, grandma had a large house with servants, and the, f the second phone in the town. So um, he 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 was Irish, and he apparently I've been told recently there were IRA connections. But for whatever reason, he did fall out of favour. Uh, he ended up uh, a pauper and a broken man. So we didn't retain the wealth. It's always the way, isn't it? <laughs> so Joseph Barcroft, um, Dorothy Dufton became an assistant to Joseph Barcroft after she. Um, after she'd been his pupil, and he was the head of the physio physiological department at Parton Down. Um, she helped co-author the 1918 and 1919 reports of the Parton Down Chemical Warfare Committee. Um, Barcroft worked at Parton Down in uh, World War I, and he um, remained in contact between the wars, and then um, he was called back during World War II to work there, and then he went on to, ca um, to carry on with his research into fetal development. Um, he was interested in finding mediums in which fetuses could be delivered um, to, to gestate, to grow, uh, which has got interesting implications. That's why Parton Down would be interested to have him as the head of the physiological department with his background and expertise in uh, fetal development and... Um, and intergenerational sciences. He was also studying, this is what I mean about the crossover between subjects that was going on at the time. He um, also led an expedition to Tibet to study altitude sickness. Um, and we know that that is something that um, some of the uh, Nazi scientists were also very interested in altitude sickness and um, how people perform at high altitudes. Um, obviously, when they're developing aircraft and they're going higher and higher, this needs to be taken into consideration. So another pupil of Joseph Barcroft was William Gray Walter. Now, um, he worked on radar, as uh, Churchill said here, and he also wrote books about synthetic hypnotism with his wife, who here was pictured. Now, he was... Um, he worked in, in Bristol for uh, many years, um, and he was connected with the Macy Foundation. He was an attendee at the Macy Cybernetic Conferences. So um, there we have our link to MK Ultra. 
and uh, William Gray Walter. Um, he discovered the delta and theta rhythms. He created the first electrodes for deep implantation in the brain, and he determined the flicker rates uh, that televisions would, that would best induce a hypnotic state. Um, so he was working on these things at, at the Burden Institute. His speciality was recording brain waves. Um, the, uh, the, the machine that records brain, wa brain waves um, that notates them. And um, he was working um, at a place called the Burden Neurological Institute in Bristol. So um, eugenic roots, the Burden Neurological Institute was, um, it was, the Burdens were a missionary couple and they used to run the Stoke Park um, mental colony which housed um, up to 1,750 patients. Um, now, they wanted to, they proposed a plan to test the entire population at the age of 11, and those that were under par would go into um, a massive national um, mental colony. And this is in 1939, and um, they would be a cheap so source of labor. Now, now the um, plan was moderated, and they instead donated um, the building, the money to open Burden Neurological Institute. However, in 1947, 85,000 children um, born in 1936 were tested, uh, had took an intelligence test at the age of 11 in the Scottish Mental Survey. Um, there were many tests uh, going on uh, sponsored by the Eugenic Society that, and they, they were administrated from the London School of Economics. <coughs> Now, um, the first uh, leucotomies that took place, or lobotomies as they're called in America, took place at um, the Burden Neurological Institute, and um, a couple of nearby hospitals offered up their patients as guinea pigs. Uh, Frederick Goller was the director, and he was persuaded by William Sargent to carry them out because London um, County Council had refused him permission. So, um, one poor chap, there were five patients operated on, one poor chap had only been in hospital four days because he was a, he'd broken down after the bombing raids in Bristol and, um, and had been diagnosed neurotic and he'd only been in hospital four days. Um, there's, there's many, many horror stories about the cosmies, but the interesting thing is it was that sergeant's involvement there right at the beginning, I think. And Gray Walter was also um, present at the first uh, use of electric shock, shock treatment in Britain in um, 1940. Uh, despite that, the fact that he was known as a cyberneticist, he was also dabbling in neurosurgery. Um, he was building machines with functions replicating human functions that could be conditioned, basically. That was his, uh, his area of uh, speciality. And um, so um, in 1977, they were still um, doing research at the BNI. And um, this is the thing about the attitude of the doctors towards the public. It, it's not quite, they're not quite on the, they don't consider themselves quite on a par. For example, some, some, some patients had sent home with two 34-way sockets in their heads. Now, this isn't a picture of that. This is just quite an evocative image I managed to find. But um, they, they'd be sent home with these two 34-way sockets in their heads. and. Um, this chap, um, Ray Cooper, who was director of the Burden Neurological Institute in 1977, actually said, they can, ca they can carry on as normal, they can live normal lives, because they can just have a piece of gauze over the sockets and wear a head covering. And that's the, their view of what the public, that, that would be a normal life for the public. They wouldn't think of it, that as a normal life for themselves. Of course, here's the eugenic, here's the eugenic attitude. They just had that little shift. To a eugenic attitude towards the public. So, um, <clears throat> so William Gray Walter, um, he was. There were new breakthroughs happening in the effectiveness of applying cybernetics to psychology, which led to psychiatry becoming an established discipline. And a series, as soon as. Um, 
William Gray Walter identified this, uh, that when people, you will have heard of this probably, I think it's called something like the negative contingent variant, and w so that when you're going to make a decision to do something, say I'm going to pick up that glass of water, the impulse would have shown on a, on a graph if I was wired up before I even realised I was going to do it. Um, so, for example, William Gray Walter was the first person to observe this. So we'd have um, people looking at slides and he was, they were given a button to press when they wanted the slide to change, but they were they were wired up and it was the brain impulse that was changing the slides. The, the button was a dummy button and they were complaining that they were changing too quickly before they were ready, but they were changing on the impulse the, on the brain impulse that was being recorded. So when this was discovered, the eugenicists just loved it because this was the kind of thing that they loved to hear, that, man, that the masses are just um, nothing more than a complex but pre predictable combination of chemicals and electronic impulses. And so uh, around this time, they called... Um, the World Health Organization organized some um, conferences to uh, discuss the psychobiological uh, development of the child so they could apply this insight that they gained through the me mechanical and electronic insight into how the brain worked uh, could be applied to uh, psychology and psychiatry and the population. So uh, William Gray Walter... Um, as I said, he was a neurophysicist, uh, but he was invited along, along with people such as um, Frank Fremont Smith, a chairman of the Macy Foundation, um, Margaret Mead, also associated with Tav Tavistock, John Bowlby, um, Tavistock psychiatrist again, Eric Twist, who actually described William Gray Walter as his best friend in his autobiography. Um, and so, yeah, William Gray Walter's there in Bristol um, in 1953-54 saying uh, child refugees again, another, another eugenic statement really, his view, view of uh, the refugees being horrible creatures. And uh, interestingly, from my point of view, it's rather difficult to get children who've been traumatic, through a traumatic psychological experience and arranged to observe them long enough and carefully enough um, now, this is interesting to me because uh, I've, I've read that from in Fritz Springmeier that the Illuminati were particularly interested in children from Catholic backgrounds because they're more ripe for um, experimentation because they have already been traumatized to some extent um, in, in many cases or, they, or, or they're, they're veering towards that... Um, being that way, because as a Catholic, I was brought up as a Catholic, and I was moved down to um, very close to Bristol, in actual fact, t uh, about 10 miles away from Bristol at the age of four. Um, yeah, so we know that the Macy Foundation uh, was used as a front uh, for the CIA to um, filter um, money through to the um, academic establishments, the medical community. Now, um, some of the topics that were discussed at the Macy conferences, which are um, which have been documented, as I say, to be. Um, the, the attendees at the Macy conferences, the Macy Cybernetic conferences, were the psychiatrists that were documented to have worked on LK, MK Ultra projects. So um, they were discussing child psychology, analog versus digital approaches to psychological models, formal modeling applied to the chicken pecking order formation. Um, and uh, memory, and uh, there was an appeal for collaboration between physics and psychology. Uh, and many of the attendees went on to do extensive government-funded research on the psychological effects of LSD as a potential tool for interrogation in the CIA's MKUltra program. The Macy Foundation also sponsored a series of gestational uh, conferences uh, considering fetal studies, and Barcroft's son uh, attended these and went on to research LSD, uh, again, fetal, fetal development LSD, you know, the way that they crossed over from subject to subject was incredible, really. So some of the Macy attendees there, um, Abramson was known to have given LSD to the chairman of the Macy Foundation, Frank Fremont Smith, 
and from the UK, William Ross Ashby. Ashby. Um, we've got John von Neumann there. He was um, a mathematician, a Margaret Mead, the anthropologist, Norbert Weiner, the cyberneticist. So in the UK, uh, the cyberneticists were, um, they, they created their own group called the Ratio Club, and sev uh, it was invitation only, I think it was based at Cambridge, and um, at some of the attendees were uh, involved in wartime signals interpretation um, at Bletchley Park. Um, We've got there the um, we've got there some of the members meeting with um, with uh, Norbert Weiner or Weiner, um, and I'd just like to just uh, read a little quote here about who McCulloch was, because he was also intimately uh, involved in MK Ultra. So, um, and Andre Poharic, Poharic studied the effects of radio waves on animals in Northwestern University in the 1940s and later founded a, a laboratory he called the Roundtable Foundation of Electrobiology. His associate in the organization was Warren S. McCulloch of Bellevue, an early advocate of electronic brain implants and chair of conferences sponsored by Joshua Macy Jr. Foundation. Poharic was later employed in the Army's Chemical and Biological Warfare Center at Fort Detrick, Maryland, researching the effects of LSD for the CIA in 1954. He perfected the radio tooth implant, a small little relay and receiver tr and transmitter. Poharic also worked at the Permanent Research Foundation and was funded by Sandoz Chemical Work. Um, I think it, I've got a quote here, and I think it's from Jim Keith, another researcher, and he says, um, English anthropolo anthropologist Gregory Bateson had a lifelong commitment to reprogram humanity. Bateson's British and American intelligence-sponsored takeover of the nascent field of cybernetics in the 1950s from its creator, Norbert Weiner, led directly to Bateson's LSD-driven experiments on schizophrenia and creativity in Palo Alto, which in turn were the origins of Ken Kesey's Merry Pranksters and the house band The Grateful Dead. So you see the connections between the cyberneticists and... Um, the Merry Pranksters, the Grateful Dead, and etc. So, in England, we had Ross Ashby, who invented something that was called uh, the Home Use Stat Machine, considered to be the nearest thing to a human brain. These they built these models so they could um, understand programming, and then they applied it to um, then they applied it to uh, to psychology, basically. And uh, interestingly, when um, he a couple of weeks before he developed the homeostat machine, he um, seemed to have some strange symptoms. Um, this is a quote from his journal and um, about the strange condition he found himself in. And uh, considering how the CIA were dropping LSD in each other's drinks, and it was being so there's so much of it about at the time, it just makes you wonder when you see a quote like that. Now, we do know that there were physicians working in the UK with LSD experimentation. Um, Ronald Sanderson, Thomas Ling, John Bookman, John Elks, and, um, sorry, Joel Elks, who's known for certain to have been um, one of the primary covert contractors in CIA's MK Ultra, advising Porton Down and thus MI6 on the interrogation possibilities of LSD. Um, yeah, so what happened was there was, um, I've just lost my figures here, I've got some, a, bit, a few statistics that go with this. Um, Ronald Sanderson's initial research was conducted on a small scale until a friend stepped in. This friend was Professor Joel Elks, head of the Department of Experimental Psychiatry at the University of Birmingham, at the time advising Parton Down. He encourages Sanderson's work with LSD and arranged for a £50,000 grant from the Regional Hospital Board um, 
Now, considering that in 1972, um, a three-bedroom suburban house with a garden and a view cost uh, £2,800, £50,000 in the 1950s can be put into perspective. And Lobster Magazine, where I got this quote from, asked, was the local health board really that enlightened? Or was this... Um, or was this money coming from uh, government-sponsored research, basically, from intelligence services? So uh, Joel Elks then went to work at Queen Elizabeth Hospital in uh, Washington and, uh, and was very much part of the MKUltra experiments. Um, one of his um, co-authors, uh, who was called Bradley, um, was also working on LSD. They, they were working on human, um, human, they experimented on humans, but they liked to do it on cats as well, because then they could um, chemically analyze the brains afterwards. It's very, it's very distressing. Um, so, um, yeah, so just to get on to my own um, background now. Yeah. Um, if I asked myself, if I was um, part of an experiment, which um, I, I've come to feel that I am, I, as I said, I just I have got no retrieved memories and I haven't attempted to recover them yet, and I am going to, but I wanted to research the background first to see if there was, you know, was it just a, something I thought, or what is, was there any solid evidence there for it? Now, I was part of the National Child Development Surveys, which were carried out in 1946, 1958, and 1970 at 12-year interv intervals. Um, they were studying a group of children who were all born in one week of, in a particular year. So I was born on the 8th of March, and anybody, say, between the 6th of March and the 13th of March would be part of this survey. So that's 17,000 children in the 1958 survey. Now, I've been doing a bit of research into, into the uh, National Child Development Surveys, and I found out that the initial one in 1946 was funded by the Eugenics Society and the Nuffield Foundation. The one in 1958 was, founded, uh, was funded sorry, by the National Birthday Trust Fund, um, which was an organisation ostensibly to help women, less, fewer women die in childbirth. But it becomes clear that, again, it's another one of these charitable organisations that seem to be doing good, but when you look a bit closer, you find out that they're actually supporting the New World Order agenda. And, um, for example, one of the people closely associated with um, the National Birthday Trust Fund was uh, Lucy Baldwin, wife of the Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin, who was a member of the uh, Knights of St. John of Jerusalem. Um, they did uh, supposedly help working class women, but there's an account of how they invited 50 of them to one of their big dues and they weren't allowed to eat at the main table and so on. So it really, it really wasn't... Uh, as as uh, as um, nice as they pretended to be, basically. Now, um, I've looked at the documentation of the National Child Development Survey, and there's nowhere in it does it say that the children will be visited like we were every three months by a doctor who made an 80-mile round trip to come and see us. Um, it actually said that they only managed to get the funding for an initial survey of the parents at birth, and then in 1965 there was the first follow-up. So there's, there's nothing whatsoever about the attention that we got. Um, I asked my parents, I just, off, I just happened to think to say to them, well, when was the last time you saw this doctor? I said, well, always the same doctor. 2003. What? 2003, he visited them because um, we were... We were monitored up to the age of four when we moved down to Bath, and then we came back to Rochdale at the age of 12, and then he continued to visit them. So um, I, I was wondering if that's where we might have been picked up. So we moved to Bath in Somerset, which is, um, as I say, only about 10 miles from the Burden Neurological Institute, but it was also um, a very Masonic city. Um, there's, a, there's a big... Um, spring there that gives forth um, one million litres of hot water a day. So 
so you, you can imagine, you know, the Romans thought this was wonderful. They built this wonderful baths here, and there's all um, Masonic kind of uh, architecture and uh, Masonic symbols everywhere. And the, the Freemason um, architects of Bath actually asked to be buried in the village that we were moved to, which was in uh, Swainswick, just outside Bath. Um, when we moved to the village of Swainswick, there were only 270 residents there at the time, and the entire village was, is owned by, is still owned by Oxford College, Oriel College, Oxford, where Cecil Rhodes established his Rhodes Scholarships. Um, everyone in now Lower Swainswick, where I lived, was basically just a load of mansions, probably about eight mansions, and the grounds and some cottages where the workers in the, to these mansions worked. Uh, now. Just before we moved there in 1962, they built two roads on, in the grounds of one of these mansions called the Elms, and there were just um, 10 houses on my street and about 20 houses in the next street, so that's all that was there. So there were only 270 residents in the whole of Swainswick. In, in Lower Swainswick, there was just these two new roads. Um, everyone that lived on my street was working for, for the armed forces, for the Admiralty. Um, and I've discovered that um, we were 3.6 miles from Rudlow Manor. So um, Rudlow Manor is um, it's built on a huge network of quarries and tunnels, which um, 250,000 square meters of which is, well, this is what this, they've admitted to, is being used um, as underground um, storage and uh, facilities. They don't go into any detail. So um, it's well known amongst UFO researchers because it is uh, where the, it was a coordination point for dealing with reports of UFO sightings. And the Skynet system, the Skynet computer system is also housed in that vicinity um, because there's another big base, MOD Fox Hill, three miles away from our house too, the house we were living in. Um, now this is quite interesting. They kept it fairly quiet because a chap on the BBC World War II website um, was trying to find out what his father did there after the war. And he rang, he rang them in 2005 and he was told, oh no, the base shut after the war and all the records are destroyed. Now that in fact was not the case because in 2011 the, um, the local council cooled down uh, it was reported in the local newspaper that uh, 1,200 staff from the Bath area are in the process of being transferred and another 1,400 are scheduled to follow in the next two years. The closure of all sites would end the MOD's 72-year association with Bath, having had off offices in the city since the start of the Second World War. Um, however, not, not all of the Enslay site can be disposed of because the computer systems cannot be moved. So presumably that's the Skynet system. Right, so one of the uh, mansions that um, was very close to our house in Swains which was called the Elms, and just uh, in 1939, a couple lived there called the McVicar, and, and the maiden name of the, his wife was called Wallace, Alice Wallace, and she died in 1939, so he built a park there in... Um, in memory of his wife. Now, I happened to find out that, oh yes, um, the, um, the, the Wallaces made their money at the same Kimberley Diamond Mines as Cecil Rhodes. Now, um, they had a big house in Essex and they also had a house in South Africa, both called Greystones. And there's a, quite a well-known movie made about Greystones. And, and this is her family, Alice Wallace's family. The park was called Alice Park. And um, it was frequently, frequently visited by Queen Mary and also Agatha Christie, as it happens, I just noticed. Um, but the Queen Mother has also been pictured there doing, planting fruit trees. Now, after, after uh, ceremoniously planting fruit trees, um, after his wife died, he built, up, he built the park and he started these children's clubs for the local village children to do sports, etc. Um, did that's uh, McVicar. Now, oddly enough, um, my family have got um, links with Queen Mary because my grandfather's mother worked for uh, the dressmakers to Queen Mary, and her, Queen Mary's. Vi 
dresses were fitted on, on my grand, great-grandmother. And my grandfather's father worked for the Phillips the Jewelers to the royal household too. So another coincidence really that we will move to this area where uh, it's associated with, with uh, so there's a big, big Illuminati connections there. Um, the, um, the guy who um, designed the pavilion in um, Alice Park was George Jellicoe, and he was godson of, of King George. Now he was a, um, also um, he was also a, a member of the Honourable Knights of the Round Table and the other club, which was founded by Winston Churchill to advance the interests of the leading aristocracy aristocratic and Illuminati families in the UK. Um, he was also twice director of SG Warburg um, Finance and Development. So um, there's the pavilion there that he designed in, uh, in Alice Park. Now, um, he was also known to have worked alongside Guy Burgess and Kim Philby in the, in the Foreign Office during the Cold War. Now, my mother told me that somebody involved in the Cambridge Five scandal lived in Elm Grove, the next row to us. And I said, oh, who, Mum, who, who? She, I can't remember now, she said, but she became, my mother became godmother. He lived with his mother and his grandmother, and the grandmother converted to Catholicism while we were there, and my mother was asked to stand as godmother. Um, so um, I'm still working on that trying to remember which one. I'm like, well, which one? So that was in Elm Grove, one of the other, uh, the other street in um, Swainswick. Now, um, uh, the, the house for the provost of, of Oxford University was just at the bottom of our road, about 200 yards from our house. And interestingly, Lord Byron, now, we, we used to live in a council house in Rochdale before we moved to Bath in Somerset, and um, Lord Byron is very much associated with Rochdale, and he used to, he, he used to visit the um, Eden Hall there. So when we went there, of course, we went to the, uh, the, the Catholic um, school in the center of the city, and um, the headmistress there was called Sister Ignatius Loyola, which is a very unusual uh, name for to, to choose. So it does imply, of, obviously, he was or Ignatius Loyola was the head of the Jesuits, the founder of the Jes Jesuits, and some say the Jesuits, uh, the Jesuits actually that Ignatius Loyola was the founder of the Illuminati. So the Jesuits are what's known as the Black Popes, the military. Um, the military wing of the Vatican, and uh, so my headmistress had called herself after the uh, Illuminati uh, founder. Yeah, and so what struck me was um, there were lots of twins in my class. This is one of the little things that started this research was that um, there were three sets of twins in my class, and there were about my, another boy in my class who these just all moved to the area at the same time that we did, and. Um, a boy in my class had twin sisters too, and they moved away back to their own respective um, places that they come from when we did, when we were 12. So the other thing that made me, um, made, was a bit of a shock to find out was that um, my mother, when I was interviewing her, said that she was one of twins herself. Oh, no, what, what she said was, oh, you, your grandma used to say that I, I was a twin as well. So I'm like, um, what? <laughs> You're a twin? What? Well, where's the other twin? She said, oh, well, my mum used to say that the other twin was crying in the corner of the room, and uh, then they took it away. Now, a priest attended the birth, a Catholic priest, and a midwife, and... Um, my mum's circumstances are very congruent to being a twin because she only weighed three pounds, but she was fully formed and she lived at home. She was born at home, she stayed at home, she survived perfectly well. Now, if she'd have been premature and three pounds, she would have needed intensive care. So that does seem to bear out what she said. Now, um, I do believe that my mum was... Um, now, Frank, actually, I'll just tell you what Fritz Springs Mayer says about twins. It's very interesting. He says... When one twin disappears, the surviving twin will often develop psychological problems around the disappearance, even if the child is never told that they had a twin. The Illuminati believe that the soul of a dead 
twin goes to, into the live twin. They consider twins, which have two souls, to be very powerful individuals. Um, so they think that the, the other twin attaches itself astrally to the, to the uh, surviving twin. Now, um, my own twin sister, um, oddly enough, I've just found out as well that her husband is, has been working under the Official Secrets Act for the t last 20 years. He was taken out into, into the car and he was asked if he wanted to do... The, he's, he's some kind of engineer. I, I've only just found this out, actually. And um, asked if he wanted to do this work. He was working for British Aerospace and he said, yeah, and they said, oh, yeah, we'd... Uh, we, we've vetted your family and they're all okay. Because I was speaking to him about my father-in-law and I, I said, oh, do you know who he is? Um, because my, um, my father, my ex-father-in-law was the head of um, RTE, which is the equivalent to the BBC in England. It's the radio television air. And, and he was the first um, head of news, the news department there. And... Um, he uh, was the person who decided how the news would be presented to the Irish uh, public. Um, now, in his obituary, obituary to, it said that he boasted about blowing up power stations in the UK, and he was also interned in the UK for some time. So I said to Chris, I said, well, do you know who my father-in-law was? And he goes, oh, yeah. I said, well, do you know what he did? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I know who he did. He says, and, but they still let me, you know, they still said it would be all right. They checked out my family background, and I was fine to do this work. And he says, he says my brothers are working in the, up in developing weapons up in, um, I think he said up in... Newcastle, did you say, somewhere up there? He said, and they're going to be ready in, nine, in 2025. He says, but I don't think I should be telling you that. So that, that's what he said. But it was just a bit of a surprise to find out. I thought that none of our family had any military connections whatsoever. So to suddenly find this, uh, these connections is a bit weird. Now, um, Fritz, Fritz Spring Mayer says that to ensure that programming, and he says this about Catholics, to ensure that the programming and abuse stays hidden from even the slave. The slave is given a daily dose of trauma as the child it keeps the child disassociative. One of the Illuminati's fronts is the Catholic Church, which the, which the Jesuits manage for the Illuminati. Um, and, and he goes on to say how many Catholic clergymen have been involved in creating the uh, trauma ne network, creating trauma-based mind control slaves. Now, the point I was going to make with this picture here is that my mother, um, uh, as it says there, um, the droopy left arm, my mother actually did have a droopy eye. Uh, as well, which she always said was um, because she was hit with snowball as a child, but um, I just wondered, you know, um, because I do feel that if I do feel that the that my grandfather and my mother were actually handlers and that they were programmed um, that 's my how I feel about it, and that, that's what, um, when I do go into br um, bringing up some memories, because I haven't done any regression or anything to look in, in some memories, but I will, um, that's what I'll be expecting to find out. Now, um, I was contact I was doing my family tree recently, and um, I was contacted by um, somebody on there, and she said, oh, uh, I'm related to you. She said, my, um, my grandmother was your granddad's sister, and she was taken away to be educated at the age of four by an auntie and another woman called Mary Thomas. I don't know who this Mary Thomas was. However, she went on. She went to university in the 50s when women didn't very often do that. She had a son, and her son uh, was a mathematical genius um, to some extent. He went, uh, he got a color... Um, Scholarship to Cambridge at the age of 17, and when he did his PhD, he went straight into the Royal Air Establishment. Um, she sent me this newspaper clipping about him where it says that um, he... Um, he was considered by colleagues to have a brilliant mind. He went straight into the RAE as a defense research scientist, working on the design of Concorde. Um, he helped organize the defense research agency when the RAE, when it split from the RAE, when the RAE was dismantled and, and Thatcher rearranged it all and the defense research agency was formed. He was there helping her to do that. He organized the Farnborough air shows um, internationally as part of 
participation in specific programs involving collaboration within NATO, took him to France, Germany, and the US, into the Pentagon. He was in London at the time of the Gulf War and also took chair in the Commonwealth Collaboration Conference in Australia. So his daughter, who contacted me, she said, I said, oh, what do you do? Oh, well, uh, well very boring. I work for an American defence company. I've been there all my life, you know, right. Why am I not surprised, you know? Um, so uh, she also said when he died, she looked through his papers, found he was learning to speak Russian. So anyway, some of the family background that I've, I've mentioned up to now has come through her because we've been collaborating on trying to find out um, what our, uh, our ancestors, what do you call them, our family, what they did and so on. Now, what I found is that... <coughs> excuse me. Is that... My uh, mum is very dismissive of what her mum used to say. So my grandmother was trying to tell us that something was happening. Um, she's the one who kept saying, there's a connection with Lady Moran. There's a connection with Queen Mary. Um, the dressmakers and so on. Now, she wasn't... I'd just look at her and think, Grandma, I'm not impressed. I'm not impressed. I'm not a royalist. You know, I never took any of it in. I thought, oh, be quiet, you silly little lady. You know, And... Um, if I could invite anyone to dinner, as they say from history, it would be grandma, to find out what it was she was trying to tell us. Um, she's, she wasn't talking about her own family. She wasn't going, oh, we're connected. You know, aren't we great? She was saying, your granddad, it was my granddad's family she was telling me about. And um, I've tried impressing my mum, but my mum is really dismissive. Oh, she said Lady Moran. I don't know. I don't know what she was on about. Oh, yeah, well, she said I was a twin, you know. She's got this dismissive attitude, and in that I hear my granddad. Now, my mom, my granddad would have been going, oh, silly woman, silly woman, what are you talking about? Be quiet. And my mum was the apple of my granddad's eye. So when he was in the home guard, he took my mum with him, and he took her and showed her these charts that show what aircraft, the shapes of the aircraft, and she had to learn all those by heart and, um, and that her and granddad were like that and grandma was kind of ignored and dismissed and she's actually I've got this picture here which shows the lady that was taken away at the age of four, my granddad's sister there on the far left and my grandmother is third from the left in the middle there and um, the other two are my granddad's other sisters with one of their husbands there. So it was my grandma who's really remembering things that she said has really helped me to put this jigsaw together. Right, so how are we doing for time? I'll just uh, check. OK, so when we were living in Bath, um, one of the mansions in Swainswick behind us, about two, three hundred yards away, was on Enslay Lane. If you remember, the base was called the Enslay Base, where the, um, the computers are being housed, the Skynet computers. And on Enslay Lane was Balebrook Lunatic Asylum. Now, um, what's kind of interesting about Balebrook is that in 1895, the medical director was called Emery Lamphere, and he was um, the founder of the American Medical Association. There were two people that founded it, Emery Lamphere and Omen Doomsnil. So in Bath, in um, Balebrook, in Swainswick, it was like, it was that kind of place, you know, it was the elite kind of Illuminati kind of place, basically, and, and there he was the founder of the American Medical Association. Now, um, he was, um, in 1895, he was uh, already doing boring holes into the skulls of patients, or trepanning, as it was known. And um, he used to le lecture on the operant, operant treatment of idiocy. In fact, Bath is where the first... Um, it's very much associated with um, the care of um, patients, mental patients. It goes way, way back to the... Uh, in actual to the uh, 10 or something 10 or something actually and in the 1600s one of the first um, institutions was, was there um, and so on anyway the what is what is interesting though about Balebrook is that the guy that was medical director that there when we were there um, he was medical director of Balebrook, and he was also um, head of child psychological services throughout the whole of Bath. And he's, he is actually well known for something completely different. He's known as... Um, He's known as somebody who 
felt that he was part of a soul group reincarnation of the Cathars. Um, and he's written many books on this. And um, he... he he was interested in the Cathars. He was very interested in the Cathars. But he was a scientifically-minded chap. <coughs> that was his, his... He wasn't interested in the paranormal in any way until he was approached by a lady who said that she'd been dreaming about him and she felt that he was a reincarnation of one of the Cathars. Now, I didn't know what the Cathars were. I went and looked them up. They were um, a, a sect of the Catholic Church who... Uh, wanted to do away with the middlemen. They didn't want the priests. They started, they were nomads and they'd go from place to place and they were vegetarians and they didn't have any rules or regulations to impose on people but they were, they were just very easygoing kind of um, breakaway from the Catholic Church and they were um, decimated, they were massacred in the Inquisition in France in I think around the 1500s so that was the Cathars and, and Gurdjum was very very interested in the Cathars so I, I think that he was, after reading his autobiography, it sounds like he was being used as an experimentee in um, a psychotronic experimentation because he would hear this high pitched noise and then he'd feel dizzy and then he'd hear these communications now, I'm electrosensitive, so when I'm around wireless equipment, I hear a high-pitched noise. I know when he was describing it, I thought, that just sounds like that noise that I hear when people are getting texts. Like, you know, I'm electrosensitive, so I, I know that that is what it was. And there's been um, an investigation done into his case, by uh, which I read about in the Psy Pioneer magazine, which concluded that this Mill, Miss Mills, who was feeding him information who's pictured there in black, um, she, uh, that she was probably a fraud because five people rang him up to say that they were her family and apparently they all sounded just the same as Miss Mills. Um, and interestingly enough, one of his children that he was seeing in his professional capacity was also drawing pictures of Cathars and writing these obscure names of Cathars on their painting. Now, because it was such an obscure subject, he was, he was, um, he was hearing, getting these dreams and hearing these communications, he was willing to believe that he was part of a soul group of Cathars that were reincarnated in Bath at the time. And um, I think that some of, the, some of the people that were interested in this soul group that were actually visiting France, they were a site where the Cathars uh, were massacred. Um, but I think that he was a scientific man and they wanted to see if they could change somebody's frame of mind from being, which is what MK Ultra documents said, that they, they were experimenting and trying to change people to the complete the opposite of what they were originally. So just interesting that he happened to be around there when um, when my, my sister and I were living there. Um, we then we, we moved back to Bath, uh, from Bath at the age of 11, at 12, or just, just before we were 12. Now, I... Um, I actually ran away from home when I was in Bath at the age of six um, because I felt something was dreadfully wrong. Um, initially, where our garden was, we had a big Victorian greenhouse full of grapes because even though we had this new little house that had been built, it was built on a, the site of this mansion, so this is a massive big greenhouse. And I got all the local kids I could get into the greenhouse. And I was trying to form a resistance group because I felt that there was ter something terribly wrong. And um, Quite, quite shortly after that, they didn't take much notice, they just giggled at me and I couldn't really communicate what I was trying to say so um, I, I actually ran away at the age of six, hoping to permanently make my home elsewhere um, and then I also tried to run away at the age of nine, but went, ended up walking miles and then coming back, realising there was nowhere to go, and then eventually at the age of 15, I ran away from home um, permanently, and um, so um, I ended up in working in um, as a as a runaway under a false name. I was sent to the Athen Athenaeum Club, um, working in Pall Mall and and actually serving members of Parliament their tea and scones up in the reading rooms. I was actually living at the top, the very very top there. We had a balcony, and that's in Pall Mall. And uh, 
So uh, this is another question I, I've had is, is, was I sent in to, to infiltrate, um, put in positions where that was possible? Because um, another lady that was associated with my family was Lady Morrison, who, who was a best friend of my auntie, um, who went on to marry uh, Lord Morrison, the Prime Minister, the Socialist Prime Minister, um, who became a film censor. Um, and there they are with Bob Hope, who's actually been named by many Illuminati man control slaves, as it happens. Um, now, the strange thing is about Lady Morrison is that she, um, after Lord Morrison, the socialist, apparently, died, she went and joined up with, um, as a council member, a very right-wing group, um, and this right-wing group of people involved people working for MI6 and MI5, um, and they were generally considered to be the ones that brought Mrs. Thatcher into power. Um, one of the people uh, on the council, she was on the council, her name's on this book, she helped co-write um, this manifesto by the, by the association, National Association for Freedom, you know, NAV. <laughs> so, um, which is just funny um, but she's there on the front of the book now <clears throat> the um, other people who on the council were really interesting they, they include Robert Moss who wrote speeches for Mrs Thatcher and um, is currently actually lecturing he, he worked for MI6 and MI5 and he's actually lecturing on dream research at the SLN Institute at the moment how um, people can have joint dreams and can go into each other's dreams and so on um, so but, but what, what struck me as being odd was the fact that these were all um, by no means socialists whatsoever they were um, involved in a right wing uh, coup basically to try and bring Thatcher into power because um, the other people involved were involved with the, in, the um, infiltration of subversive groups such as um, the <coughs> people um, who were running unions and uh, the pop festivals and so on. Um, so interesting because I felt that I was um, possibly part of maybe a program to infiltrate into um, the home of the um, the head of the RTE News and, and, and possibly I was put in the Anathium Club too. I could have easily dropped LSD and sort of those guys uh, drinks and food. And um, strangely enough, Harold Wilson was convinced that people that MI5 and MI6 that there was a plot against him by the intelligence services. So. That was um, just trying to run briefly through. Oh, yeah, and there's an uh, who I was married to through um, through that later part of my life. So we're just getting to the end of um, the time here, and I wondered if we've got a bit of time left, Joanne, if we could, if anyone's got any questions, or uh, have I completely blasted you with too many facts? <laughs> nope. Right. Well, what um, my next step is going to be is to um, obviously I, I feel that I have established um, a very, some very uh, convincing and compelling evidence. Basically, the sheer volume of it, and every time I've looked into something, it's it's oh, it's just giving up more and more. So, I think it's a good basis uh, to proceed with some. Um, some regression and to try and uncover um, some actual memories in that way because I just wanted to stay grounded and get the facts first of all before proceeding you know I didn't want to think oh ding you know that's happened to me and then wander off to a regressive therapist and who knows you know I, that might mean that you just manufacture sort of fantasies so um, I've done this research as a basis to establish um, the possibility that that um, something did happen and um, now that I do have that basis my next step will be to go uh, for some, some help with um, getting memories back so thank you very much for being so receptive and uh, that's great thanks
Peter. I, I just wanted to ask Cathy, actually, um, how, how, this, how your whole experience has, has impacted you on your health and wellness and your ability to be functional in life. Um, it's impacted me um, greatly actually I've always been um, terribly, terribly isolated and I've never had a peer group Um, I think um, they can do this when you've got a twin actually so um, I think I was actually separated from my twin psychically as well as physically um, all the way through my life and my mother was very, we were very much conditioned you know um, toilet trained at the age of six months and we were made to recite pieces, long pieces of perform, you know, and, um, and uh, behavioural measures. We were um, really conditioned. It's, it's quite hard to explain, really. Um, yeah, it, it's been um, strange, actually, because um, I've had... Um, very, it's very difficult for me to have done this uh, looking at my life because I've got a very little recollection of my life as a kind of whole and it's very fragmented so um, it's impacted me very, very much yeah. Well I, I have to say folks you know we're all coming from such different points in our, in our lives and we've all had different things but you know I think in this field with the mind control and these issues and the people who have um, like Chantelle's experiences and and everybody else here, we all have our own, but these things, you know, when people are so isolated, you know, we just need to be more supportive, we need to be more open-minded and we need to really give absolute kudos to people like Kathy for coming forward for probably the first time publicly with her research about her own personal life and and I know um, it may not all have been easy to take in, but this is the beginning for us. And, you know, I've said before uh, that the material that Amash will come across may not be easy listening. We never promised that. We just promised to tell the truth or the truth on behalf of others or to bring in people to tell their own truth and to give them a safe platform in which to do that. So I just want to say thank you, everybody, and thank you, Cathy. Please Thanks, give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Okay, guess what? It's muffin and coffee and tea time. Yay. Um, I'm going to um, do the raffle at the end of, you know, just as we come back for the next speaker, um, who's going to be Mike Oram. And so if you want to come back, bring your tea and coffee in here, I mean, after about 10 or 15 minutes.